Hello, everyone, and welcome to FAIR's free monthly webinar series. My name is Carrie Mokowski, the National Programs Manager at FAIR, and your moderator for today's presentation, When Should I Use Epinephrine? Why Am I Afraid of It? A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This presentation will be recorded and posted on the FAIR website in just about 7 to 10 days. Please note that for maintaining a quality recording, all attendees will be muted throughout the webinar. If time permits, we will respond to some moderated questions for our presenter at the end of the webinar, which you may submit throughout the broadcast. Because attendees will be muted, we ask that you please submit these via our questions feature in your GoToWebinar panel. Um, for those of you on Twitter, we encourage you to join us in conversation during the broadcast today. You can follow along with our webinar live tweets at our handle at foodallergy or hashtag fair webinar. Next slide, please. Come on. Sorry. Oops. Funding for this webinar was made possible in part through a 2016 grant from Milan Specialty LP. We thank Dr. Spurgle, who serves as a guest speaker for this webinar and does not receive any compensation for his appearance. While Dr. Spurgle is not compensated for his work, he does receive our sincere appreciation for his time and efforts to help educate our community. Next, we'll see that our key speaker today is Dr. Jonathan Spurgle. Dr. Spurgle is a member of FAIR's Clinical Advisory Board Executive Committee. He is the Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania, Perlman School of Medicine and Chief of the Allergy Section and Director of the Center for Pediatric Eosinophilic Disorders at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Spurgo is a fellow in the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and the American Association of Pediatrics. His research interests have focused on all aspects of food allergy and atopic dermatitis. Some of his important works was the identification that peanut allergy can be outgrown, identification of genetic risk factors for eosinophilic esophagitis, commonly referred to as EOE, and the role of basophils in EOE. He serves a large role in advocacy and teaching. He has been a member of the Medical Advisory Board for American Partnership for Eosinophilic Disorders, International Association for Food Protein Induced Entercolitis, and Food Allergy Anaphylaxis Connection Team. He was chair of the Allergic Skin Committee of Quad AI. He has published over 130 articles in the field. He has also spoken at national and international conferences in the field of eosinophilic esophagitis, food allergy, and atopic dermatitis. At this time, I am very delighted to turn the presentation over to Dr. Spurgle. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So um, the topic I'll be talking about is when I should use epinephrine and why I am afraid of it, not me personally, but why patients are afraid to use it. I also just wanted to say one thing, because the issue of epinephrine and epinephrine autoinjectors has been in the news yet again, and I just want to just reiterate, I actually don't get any funding from any of the epinephrine companies, um, for good or bad, I don't get any funding from them. One bit, um, I do, I am a FAIR clinic, part of the FAIR clinical network, so I do get funding from FAIR um, as part of being part of their clinical network. So when we think, first, I want to, as the talk goes through, we're going to be talking about a few things. What is food? First of all, make sure we're on the same page about food allergies. So everyone we know is talking about food allergies because it's still it's a pretty broad topic. And then we're going to talk about what is anaphylaxis, when to use epinephrine, how to use epinephrine, and if there's any risk really behind it. So reactions, so the first thing we'll start with is reactions to foods. And reactions to foods go into this broad category called adverse reactions to foods. And they're split really into sort of toxic reactions, sort of like food poisoning, which I, at least here in the East Coast, it's lunchtime now, so I always feel funny talking about food poisoning during lunchtime. Hopefully no one's having anything. Um, to food intolerances, which are like lactose deficiency, which is when you drink milk, you can't 
dissolve the sugar, you get classic GI symptoms of bloating and diarrhea, to IgE-mediated food allergy, which is what we're really going to focus on, which is the hives, the anaphylaxis, or flaring of atopic dermatitis. The other disease that I spend a lot of time on, which is eosinophilic esophagitis, is a non-IgE-mediated disease and really does not need epinephrine for that disease at all, and we really will not really be discussing this at all. When we think about, the worst thing we think about is food fatalities. Unfortunately, they are a real thing, and they do happen. The exact frequency is a little unclear because there's no great reporting way of doing it. Most of the effort comes out of looking at ICD-9 or ICD-10 code, which is the coding doctors put in, in medical records when they see an alert, when they have a reaction. If people don't code it right, they don't know those things exist. Um, so they do occur, and the rates vary for about a, from about a tenfold range, from anywhere from 50 to 150, but that's still not an exact number. When we think about these uh, fatalities, which unfortunately do happen, the most most important thing is they tend to be more respiratory. Cutaneous reactions can occur. You can have highs, but often you do not. There's a lot of underlying risk factors which we think exist, such as asthma. It tends to be more in the classic high-risk group, which is adolescents and young adults. The most common foods are peanuts and tree nuts. But milk, unfortunately, is right behind it. People are like, oh, my God, no one can die from milk. The two deaths that we've had at our institution in the last 30 years have interestingly been both to milk. And most reactions do occur away from the house. Um, this article recently published by Paul Turner and his colleague um, looked at the rate of anaphylaxis and looked at the rate throughout the um, in three large English-speaking groups. United Kingdom, United States, and Australia. And in Australia and in the United Kingdom, the rate really has risen over the, in the last couple years, maybe flattening now. But anaphylaxis in the United States is interestingly, in, the, in this t sort of 10-year time period, is relatively flat. And it is about oh. 0 0.005 per 100,000. In the United Kingdom, it's about twice that. It's the same thing in Australia. If you really want to calculate that using that rate, the rate would be as low as 40. But since there's a probably about a ten, would potentially be a tenfold difference, the rate we typically think in pediatrics is anywhere from 4 to 40. And I just wanted that people have this great fear. This is some of one of the big things I do worry about. People get paralyzed from having food allergy. Oh my God, I I can't exist. I can't do anything. And I think that's really important. And I think that hopefully by this talk we'll get rid of some of this fear of food allergy and the fear of using epinephrine. An epinephrine device is a life-saving device, and it should not be really concerned or scared to use it. But food allergy fatalities are pretty rare. Based on the current last estimate, there are about 78 million children in the United States. And if you use that estimated rate that we just talked about, a point oh oh five per 100,000, it comes to actually be the fourth deaths a year. That's probably an underestimate and maybe as high as 40 or maybe even a little bit higher. But just to give you a perspective of three other common things that people think about. Automobiles, this is the number from the Institute for Highway Safety. There are 872 deaths a year due to an automobile in the United States in children. There are about just under 2,000 deaths a year from cancer and over 2,000 deaths from gun violence a year in the United States. So food allergies is, ser is serious and it is definitely preventable. But as you can see, there are many more likely ways to die as a child in the United States than food allergies. So I think it's important to have a tremendous amount of respect for food allergies, but not be like, oh my God, this, I'm going to die when I walk outside the house from it. Okay, so when do we, when do we worry about 
when what's our fee, when do we need to use that epinephrine device? When do we use when do we need to use what like we like to say epi? We use it for anaphylaxis, and this little blurb in the pictures is actually right from the food allergy from the anaphylaxis plan right from that fair has created. You can have anaphylaxis can occur within seconds to after eating a food to up to maybe two hours, but typically it's early on. And the symptoms can really vary. And obviously the things we worry about is wheezing, unable to breathe, having difficulty with your heart rate, unable to swallow, you can get swelling of your lip, you're going to have hives, you can have repeat vomiting, or you often know one of the more common things is, oh my God, something terrible is happening. But a lot of patients, that one I always worry a little about because there's so much fear. Some patients really um, have this, just get scared and it's not a problem. We just had a patient recently who had a, has such a severe fear reaction, they developed something called vocal cord dysfunction, that their airways, they involuntarily closed off their airway due to anxiety and ended up being hospitalized in the ICU until we realized that, hey, this was just being nervous. So you have to be sort of be careful about that. It never hurts to be over-treat because the medicines we will, epinephrine's a very safe medicine, but you need to be careful when you're having these typical reactions. And we do, we'll go over which one we would typically treat for, but usually it's any of these severe reactions or a combination of these severe reactions. The question is people always ask, can we predict? Can I predict what reaction comes what? And this is data that we published a while ago, and this, it's seen in every single study that whether you look at food-specific IgE, the immunocap, or people often call it the RAS testing, or skin testing, they do not predict the reaction. This is skin testing we looked at at our institution when we did food challenges. So this is a very controlled situation, so we really know what everyone's getting. As you can see, there is a slight difference. The patients who had anaphylaxis on a food challenge had slightly bigger skin testing. But actually, there is a, there's this all not significantly significant. There's such a large overlap of numbers, nothing can tell. And some of that's due to the fact, as you can see, all the things I listed below can cause this change to severity of reaction. You can think about it even from like a food, whether you drink a sip of milk or a, ga or a glass of milk, or one peanut or a whole peanut butter and jelly or sandwich, the amount of reaction probably will change the intensity. If your overall health is bad, if you're particularly sick at the time, you're much more likely to have a severe reaction. This is what we know from allergy shots. We've been doing allergy immunotherapy for, for 100 years. We don't give allergy immunotherapy when someone's sick because the reaction is going to be worse. Um, whether you're fasting, whether you have alcohol, which changes things, exercise, stress, other medications such as NSAIDs, all which can change the severity of a reaction. So what happens if you use epinephrine late? Say, hey, we don't, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait. What happens if we use it late? The data seen in almost, first of all, no one's ever going to be able to pull through this in a true clinical trial. What we wanted in theory in clinical trial to prove things in medicine, the way you would have to do it is what we can sort of consider a double-blind trial. Well, one person gets treated early, one people gets treated late. No IRB would ever allow you, allow you to do this because this would be considered unethical. You always have to treat someone. But you can look at epidemiological studies, looking at people exposed, because some people are more reluctant. And we'll go over in a minute what reluctancy is, why some people get treated earlier than late. And what is seen pretty clearly is an increased rate of hospitalizations, an increased rate of biphasic reactions. I'll go over in a minute what that is and possibly even increased rate of fatalities, even though fatalities are a very rare event. So what, what about hospitalization? So there was a review looking at epinephrine use at Hillsboro Hospital in Rhode Island. And they looked at the, all the cases that had anaphylaxis in the, before they got to the ER. They looked at the ones who got it beforehand and the ones who got it in the ER, so got it later. Um, Interesting, no, not all the patients got, who had anaphylaxis got epinephrine. 
We always want that to be 100%, but this was actually 61%, which is still needs some improvement. But of those patients, 70% of them had it before they got to the emergency room and 30% later. The ones who got it earlier did better. They had a decreased rate of hospitalization. So this, this sort of data suggests that, hey, if we get epinephrine earlier, we'll prevent the severity of the reaction, make the reaction less severe. What about a biphasic reaction? So what is a biphasic reaction? What we consider a biphasic reaction is, hey, I had an allergic reaction. I'm fine for four to six hours. Then the reaction occurs again. That's considered a biphasic reaction. The rate of biphasic reaction is very unclear. It ranges anywhere from, as you can see, from 0.4 as high as 15%. More recently, all the studies do suggest that is probably much closer to the lower end. In our hands at Oral Food Challenge, and similar to work done by Yitzhak Katz and um, the group at Sinai, it's probably less than 2%. And interestingly, no one has seen a more severe reaction. So reaction doesn't tend to get worse. In the clinical trials of oral immunotherapy, there have been no reported cases of biphasic reactions recently. Um, in our institution, we recently have a manuscript that's under review that looked at the rate in our emergency room because oral food challenge people think hey that's maybe a lower rate but in our emergency room now now it's considered less than one percent so it's considered pretty rare we looked at the risk factors for this looking at in the emergency room looking at oral food challenges the only thing that makes a difference for these rare events is the use of epinephrine so potentially if you give epinephrine later the risks increase. So really suggest that, hey, by giving it earlier, you'll get less hospitalization, which is probably counts for most of the bif most of the which is probably due to biphasic reactions or a decreased risk of biphasic reactions. So it tends to potentially make the reaction less severe if we can treat it earlier. So basically it says you need to treat anaphylaxis. And we'll go over what is anaphylaxis in a second. But in generally if you have anaphylaxis, you need to treat epinephrine. It's pretty clearly that seen in almost every every single study. It is a, a life-threatening way to treat an anaphylactic event. So what does epinephrine do? So epinephrine really does two things. It works on both an alpha and a beta receptor. And what it does is it makes the veins come tighter, causes vasoconstriction, in, which increases your blood pressure which release the hypertension and shock. It also decreases the edema in the upper airway, relieving airway obstruction. It also works on a beta receptor, which causes BD, which is bronchodilatation, leads to decreased wheeling, and also decreases media release, and actually helps with the hives that patients do. So it's generally a, so it helps everything for a patient, so it's really such a, a great medication. So. This is a little video. I hope it will work. We tried it earlier on. Going over a, a, a video of what we think happens in anaphylaxis. This is a young child who ate something by mistake. And he's now getting sort of itchy mouth. His eyes are getting red, a little runny nose. And often that's what happens with the reaction. The symptoms start to occur often with such a mild symptoms. And sometimes with such a mild symptoms of these itchy eyes, you may just give an antihistamine. From a molecular side, you have these food antigens coming with you. Those are, those are the flying particles you just see. They, they bind to an IgE receptor, which is that Y-shaped molecule. And what happens then, when they bind these Y-shaped molecules, they release all these little cytokines and chemicals. And these are now going in through the blood vessel here. And they, as they go through the blood vessel, they, they sort of cause the different things that happen in the blood vessel. They can cause the blood vessel to dilate and not and leak fluid causes edema. You can cause the tongue to swell as you cause here, which causes airway problems. It also can cause your, your airway to get more narrow, making it difficult to breathe. And this is what's happening here. This person's young boy's mouth is open, getting more systemic symptoms, and this is when you really need to use epinephrine. So the question is, why are people or afraid to use it. Um, this was a study done by Bob Wood, and he really looked at why was this fear of epinephrine? Why do people lack to use it? 
And it really looked at, it was a, a survey done called anaphylaxis in America. And interestingly, they looked at a group of patients that had two more episodes of anaphylaxis. And it was interesting, less than half had an emergency action plan. Only a third attended to use it. 50%, just over 50 cents, didn't even have epinephrine. And 60% didn't have epinephrine available with them. So there's a huge number of patients who's like, hey, I don't have it, and I don't want to use it. The question is why. Um, and this is also go, going a little more of that data, that it really is typically underused. Only maybe a third of the patients who had epinephrine actually got it. And we talked about the, the rate published data from U. Sampson or published those. That's the, in the fatalities, it's usually due to a delayed use or inappropriate use along those lines. So where's the fear? So this was a study published a couple of years ago out of the group in Montreal by Chad that looked at just over a thousand patients who were, why didn't they use these epinephrine? And they asked why not? And they came, patients really had three reasons. One, they were afraid to hurt the child. The second main reason they were afraid to, where they thought they were going to use it wrong, or they thought something bad was going to happen. Interestingly, the most common reason my patients say they don't want to use it is because, oh, I'm going to use this medicine because we always tell them that you have to use epinephrine, then you have to go to the emergency room or go, call 911. And my patients usually feel, oh, my God, the medicine is dangerous. I'm, I need to go to the ER because I use the medicine. No, it's not because you use the medicine, because you had a severe reaction is why they want to go. And some of my patients tell me they don't want to go to the ER and sit around and wait. So those are the other reasons people have also said why they don't want to use an epinephrine auto-injector. So will, will the needle, what about hurting the child? Does it hurt? Will it damage the leg? Will the needle hurt the child? So in short, I've asked all my patients, does the needle hurt? Everyone who's used it, we use it, epinephrine a lot in our food challenges. We've never had a patient actually say it hurts. We've had patients inject themselves by mistake with a device as they're teaching someone how to use it, and they're like, oh, I thought that didn't feel anything. So actually, actually using the device is particularly not that painful. Will it damage the leg? It shouldn't. You've got to be pretty incompetent to damage a leg. So the answer is it's really a safe device. It doesn't cause much damage. What about side effects? So almost all the side effects are from IV use. This was a study published in by Campbell, who is really one of the ER mavens, about the use of epinephrine published in Jackie in practice earlier, late, late last year. In the IM dose, this is the typical things you see. You see an increased heart rate, which is due to the effects of epinephrine. You may get some pallor and sweating and tremor. You also get mild headache and nausea. That's what you're going to see. What about things people talk about, arrhythmia and hypertension? There have been no, this is looking in the ER. There have been no cases of arrhythmia. We actually spoke to our cardiologists about this several, several years ago, and they say, no, we treat epinephrine and we used to treat it arrhythmia. So it's not really a major issue of cardiac effect. In adults, we're worried about an angina or chest pain or more cardiac arrest. There's been one episode with a double dose of IM epinephrine and 0.8% of the cases had blood pressures greater than one, systolic greater than 120. They don't have baseline, so many of these people also may have had long standing elevated blood pressures, and almost all with double doses of IM epinephrine. So I think this the issue of arrhythmia and hypertension is really not a major concern, and I really think there's no major effects of epinephrine. So what about using it incorrectly? Where is the big fear? So Back in the early 2000s and late 90s, there were been several surveys, and it was really sort of st astonishing the how poorly people knew, whether physicians and patients. I think we've, we'll go all that down in a second. We've gotten a little bit better. But back then, only 25% knew that epinephrine, the epinephrine devices came in two packs. Um, only about half the patients had an epinephrine auto-injectors with them. And only a third knew how to use it correctly. So when we've looked at the cases received epinephrine, there have been two 
I mean, two studies that show that the work done by the last group have really made a difference in the last decade. About a, a decade ago, in, the, in 2007, only two, just under two-thirds of the cases of, of anaphylaxis actually got epinephrine in the emergency room. Now the numbers up to in the most recent study published this year is up to 97%, and most patients actually got it in the field. So it's significantly better. However, we still have a long way to go. When they look at EMT rates published two years ago, it was still anywhere from 17 to 30% of the patients that were getting epinephrine, in the, epinephrine devices in the field. So we still have a while to go. We're, we're not there yet. We still need to do better, but we are improving the use of epinephrine. So what about epinephrine devices? There are two devices available at the current time. Let's see how the pointer here. This is the EpiPen. This is the Avi Adrenal Click. And then this is the old AviQ. The AviQ is coming back, some, returning sometime in 2017. The exact date, I was told it was early 2017, but I don't know. I'm not related to the company, so I don't know when they would actually comes out, but they will be out at that point. And there's some people who do home kits, which we do not recommend. The biggest issue with home kits, when they have looked at it to, draw, to try to draw it up quickly, the studies show that people do a really bad job and usually miss the dose by anywhere from two to four fold difference. That means you either you're getting half the dose or you're two times or four times too high under a stressful situation. They say, just draw it up now when no one was close. The only people that were able to do it well were the NICU nurses and the intensive care nurses. ED nurses and physicians and parents all did really bad jobs. So the doses basically come in two dose ranges, 0.15 and 0.3. We use a recommendation if you're greater than 25 Kilograms to use 0.3, it's recommended for all ages with no lower limits. So there's two basic, all the devices really more or less do the same thing. This is the generic one you take off, it has two caps. The EpiPen has one cap, you pull off the cap here. The AviQ, which is shown here, you pull it out of the container. So you basically move the caps, move one cap, two cap, remove the cap. Then you basically push against the thigh, against the orange or the red tips, which is sort of this right here, this tip here, this tip here, or this tip here. You push against the other side and hold anywhere for three to 10 seconds, depending on the device. They're probably gonna be the same for all of them. They do have slightly different directions. And then you should call 911 because you've had a severe reaction not because you used epinephrine. Epinephrine, well, basically, you'll get, you'll, you'll be completely better at that time by the time they come. But you had a severe reaction, and some patients have what we call prolonged or protracted, that they need more than one ep epinephrine device, or they're far away from medical care, so it's important that they use it, that they call for help to make sure they get evaluated. How does it work? I mean, this is just epinephrine, as you can see. It goes down, you saw the medicine go flying down. You just push down your little click, and the medicine goes flying down through the needle. People will also say, hey, I forgot my epinephrine device. It's an old device. Now, here's something the FDA hopefully won't yell to me much about, but how stable is epinephrine? And I know the pharmaceutical companies don't want to hear this, but it's really stable. So there have been nine studies that looked at it. One study said, okay, we're going to leave it at basically for one month at basically just above freezing or actually put it below freezing for 16 hours. And then they measured how stable the epinephrine was. No difference. Someone left it out. They looked at emergency vehicles that, that were just left in, in the emergency vehicles figure, measuring out how hot and cold it was. Nothing. It seemed to be fine. What did cause a problem, though, was you put it at really high temperature for 100 hours, so you start boiling it. You leave it in open, in, out in the boiling, in, your, in a hot car, or in the, put it in the oven, you're going to have problems. But even at 40 degrees Celsius, this was done at some places down in 
in uh, Southeast Asia, where it was really hot all the time, had no effect whatsoever. And they've looked at up to two years past the expiration date. It is stable. So um, fair may be, I don't know who might be except angry if I tell people this, but this is what I tell pa pa patients as I am not doing this as, as an independent person here. We tell patients the school wants the one with the expiration date that's valid. Keep the old ones for you and your grandparents because they'll be good for about two years. When those expire, use new ones. So it will save everyone a few dollars that way. So here's the anaphylaxis plan. This is the one that FAIR has developed. And typically, they're all about the same. I'll show you one we use at our institution, which we publish through our, we get through our medical, medical records, so it's a little easier for us to use. But they're all basically the same. It has the name, what you're allergic to, what the weight is, and then whether you have a severe reaction, what to do when you have a severe reaction, when you have a mild reaction. Typically for the severe reaction, the symptoms that I talked about earlier, whether you're wheezing, uh, pale, trouble swallowing, trouble breathing, swelling of the mouth, repeated vomiting, um, then you need to use epinephrine and call 911. For milder symptoms, whether it's runny nose, hives, just nausea, often you can just get away with just an epinephrine, just a simple antihistamine. Sometimes you can get by, if you have a couple of things that things are progressing, then you need to do it. What's the most controversial is what to do if you, if you have no symptoms. And that will go over in a second. So this is our plan, which more or less says the same thing. We have our bold ones, the same as the severe ones, but in bold. Our big advantages, these come out of our medical records, so it's easier for us to do electronically. Um, but again, severe reactions, similar sort of things, whether use of antihistamines along those lines. So, when we think, think of bold symptoms, which is the same as the fair one, is if you have severe swelling, your tongue is swollen, unable to speak, your throat is tight, shortness of breath, rapid breathing, coughing, wheezing, repeated vomiting, and obviously if you're at loss of consciousness, then you need to use epinephrine. I don't think anyone in the world would disagree with you on that one. This is sort of general consensus. This is severe anaphylaxis, and you need to use epinephrine, and then call 911. The mild symptoms, this is where some people say, hey, there's a little more controversy, and this depends a little on each individual patient and your unique circumstances. So these are general guidelines, but your provider may tell you, hey, you have other risk factors, as we talked about before, where you live, what sensitivity your doses are, how well controlled your asthma is. Typically, when you have just isolated hives, or a simple abdominal pain, or runny nose, or stuffy nose, typically most people say just to use antihistamines. Um, when things get worse, as things progress, then you need to give your epinephrine. But typically for these symptoms, we will just give a antihistamine, just an isolated reaction. So really this is sort of a key slide here, when do you do it? So, and then this is that person, the first bullet points are really important caveat, because this really does change things from, from, from your nose or probably not to yes. If you had a previous severe reaction, or know that a trace amount will end, that you'll be in the intensive care unit, that you had anaphylaxis from a small amount, then in that scenario, you probably want to use epinephrine for almost everything. For you or like the patient that hey, had a trace amount of milk, a baked milk and a cookie, and I ended up in, and ended up in the intensive care unit, then yes, you did. Or when you had that you ate a that muffin that had a that some that had egg baked in it, and you ended up you passed out. That patient you need to be much more aggressive for. But if someone just ate a took a bite of peanut butter a peanut butter cookie and just had three hives, that's probably you can be not as aggressive. So. That's why when you have a potential exposure that you ate a cookie and you're not sure whether it had foods that you were allergic to, it, milk, egg, and peanut, typically we don't say anything. It may have been a fine cookie. Don't worry about it. If you get symptoms, then do. So the second scenario, hey, I ate a peanut butter and cookie, and I know I'm allergic to peanuts, but I feel completely fine. 
I would be cautious, but maybe, hey, Maybe you're outgrowing it. Let's just watch and see. So often we do not, but if you've been that severe patient before, I would probably treat you already. But those patients is much more of a gray area. And sometimes we say yes, and sometimes we say no. And that really depends on an individual patient. If you have one or two highs, we just typically have give antihistamines. If you just feel nauseous, we say, hey, often we don't do anything. But if things are progressing, if you have highs and GI symptoms, the answer is yes, you need epinephrine. If you're wheezing, you feel dizzy, you feel lightheaded, you have trouble swallowing, things are getting worse, please use your epinephrine device. There's never a wrong time to use it. It is the world's, it's a great, safe medicine. So you can never say not to use it, but for sometimes for an isolated one high, it's probably not necessary. So, there is a tremendous fear in the use of epinephrine, and a lot of people are really scared to use it. So when to use it? If you have anaphylaxis, there is no question to use it. How to use it is pretty simple for all the devices. It's removing the cap and pushing it to adhere it clicks, and then you hold for three to 10 three to 10 seconds. There are no side effects to worry about. Don't really worry. Should it be only used for severe reactions? And the answer for that is no, but it's only those patients who probably have had severe reactions before, but it doesn't need to be used on one to two highs. Consequences, do I really need to worry like, hey, I'm afraid to use it? You Don't be afraid, it will save your life but don't be afraid of food allergies. Having food allergies should not be who you are. Food allergies, you just need to have some level of caution. No matter what you have, you should be able to live your own life and don't let food allergies run it. Let you run your own life. I think that's a really important message in terms of along those lines. I've been, I've been talking for about 40 minutes now and I'll save the last 20 minutes or 10 to 20 minutes to any particular questions or concerns that some people have. And I'll give it back to our organizers over at FAIR. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Spargel. That was, that was really informative and such a great overview of just epinephrine itself. Um, I, I truly believe that it will help a lot of people overcome, you know, many of the fears of using epinephrine, um, especially at the end when you are clarifying um, when to use it. So we have some really engaged listeners, which is always great, and we got some questions, so I will begin. Um, okay, so someone wrote in and asked, how soon after epinephrine is given should I get my child to the hospital? How long, basically, does epi buy me? Um, no one has, so the, it's a great question is, because the answer is no one, no one really knows. So, because I think everyone's anaphylaxis is a little bit different. Some people have really severe, because it depends on all the factors we think that makes anaphylaxis worse, right? Whether I ate a whole bag of peanuts, or I ate one peanut, or I ate a half a peanut. So, I think that matters a little, typically epinephrine, we the, the classic teaching is 10 to 15 minutes. But okay. I, think really, I think it really depends. Some patients, I would say for the vast majority, that's all you need. You have time. But there is there is a small cohort that, will, that needs a second one quickly. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. That's a great answer. Um, another question that came through, is there any downside to administering epinephrine if it actually turns out um, not to be anaphylaxis? No, so no. So, okay. so the answer is no. I mean, besides the use of the, the use of medical resources from a pa individual patient perspective, no. It costs dollars, but besides that, no. Great, thank you. Um, I know you mentioned this kind of early on in one of your slides, but if you could, could you speak a little bit more as to why fasting could possibly impact a reaction? Um, is it because reactions vary based on an empty or a full stomach? Does that have anything to do with that? Exactly. Um, so 
depends on absorption through your stomach, and that's why we think sometimes exercise may um, changes things. And same thing, fasting versus not fasting. When you're fasting, we think empty stomachs will absorb things faster. That may get better absorption in an empty stomach. Um, fatty meals tend to leave things more delayed because things take a while to get absorbed. Um, they're based on oral immunotherapy studies, and looking at those reactions, we know exercise and actually going to hot tubs, anything that raises your core body temperature, tends to make you a little react worse because we think you're vasodilating, your blood pressure is a little bit lower at those times, um, or you're circulating your blood products through faster. So there's all those are potential reasons, but we don't know the the exact answer. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Someone wrote in and said that she often hears people say they have, quote, a mild food allergy. Um, given that we know reactions are unpredictable and can vary for the same person from reaction to re reaction, is there really anything such as a mild food allergy? Um, <laughs> it's an interesting question. So the answer is probably... What I would qualify as a mild food allergy is the patient that's almost outgrown their food allergy. That hey, that we, we at least we think over time that as you grow out, you're becoming less and less sensitive. That hey, they use that they can they only react at really large quantities of food. So maybe is that considered a mild reaction? Maybe, um, but the, the person is completely correct. We don't know. There's too many variables to, on, to predict a reaction, but there are some patients who probably will only ever get a mild reaction. We have no idea how to predict that at this current time, that, hey, they would only be mild, because we just don't know. We're trying to figure that out, but we cannot tell at this point. So if you ask me a couple of years from now, I might be say, hey, you have this phenotype? Yes, you would only get mild, but we cannot predict that. We cannot determine that right now. Okay, thank you. That that definitely makes sense and clears things up. Um, another question. When your child has a reaction and you are actually close to the hospital, what are the trade-offs between calling 911 or driving to the hospital yourself? Um, if you can drive to the hospital faster than the ambulance can get to you, um, what's your advice? Should you? Uh, tricky, tricky question. Um, the general recommendation is never to have a parent drive a child when a child's reacting in the back because the parents oh, probably will be too nervous about the child and get and you worry about getting in a car accident because they're too worried, oh my God, my child's reacting that I have to hurry and won't drive rationally. Um, so with the general recommendation is to wait, is get the ambulance, but there's always a caveat to that. I mean, if the ambulance is going to be a half an hour and, and you can get there in two minutes, it's probably faster for you to drive. I mean, you don't want to wait for the ambulance to come if they're far away. So you, it, that one you just have to be to personalize the answer to the exact situation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That definitely makes sense and kind of depends on the person and the situation. Um, here's a, another question that came in. Do you know, is there a risk of injecting epinephrine into a toddler's bone because their legs are so small? Um, I, no one's ever seen it, actually. Um, okay. I, I don't, you don't, I mean, you pull up the, you pull up the, when you grab the thigh, you pull it up and you go into the area that's subcutaneous in the muscle. Um, you would have to push really hard to inject it into a bone. The needle would probably break. Um, but in medicine, anything is possible, but I don't think that anyone's ever seen it. Okay, thank you. Um, one listener asked, is there a downside to not giving antihistamines for, a, for mild symptoms? Like could possibly not giving them make a reaction worse? Uh, no one's ever looked at that. So I was at a big, a big world allergy meeting this weekend, and we were debating that. And no one knows. When, okay. So the answer is we give antihistamines all the time, and we, no one, 
The question is, does it make the patient better? Does it make the provider better? Does it make the physician feel better? No one really knows. Because the patient, a lot of patients seem to get better by themselves really relatively fast. But I, to my mind, there's so little downside. Why not? Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you talked about, I think in one of the, the first slides, we were talking a little bit about fatalities. I don't know if you know, maybe, or you've come across in any of your research um, or your colleagues, do you know why there is a low rate of food allergy fatalities in general? Um, no, no, I don't think anyone knows why it's low. I think it could be from several reasons. One, I, so I think there'd be three, there's three possible reasons. One is that people are really careful and are cautious so they won't, they read labels and they're careful. I think the second main reason is that um, people have, better, have gotten much better using epinephrine devices, so they use epinephrine and they save people's lives. The third potential reason is people may self-limit behavior. They know all the patients, we look at our peanut oil immunotherapy trials, all of them hate peanuts. So people may not want to eat allergic food. They really eat limited amounts of allergic food. That's a possibility. And the fourth one, which is no one really knows, maybe anaphylaxis leading to fatalities is just a low event. It doesn't happen well. Your body releases enough epinephrine that it saves most people. People recover by themselves, potentially. But that's no one would ever know. That's a study that, that's impossible to figure out. Okay. So Thank you so much. Yeah, those all sound like fitting possibilities, definitely, without really ever knowing. Um, so this question came in, and I know a lot of people actually, um, you know, have asked this before, and perhaps it's an individualized situation, but um, basically when someone is in doubt and really there's not enough symptoms, you know, they often just ask, you know, simply, should they administer epinephrine? If there's so, the question is, if there's no symptoms... Well, when they're when they're when they're doubting that it is anaphylaxis and there really aren't enough symptoms to kind of tell, but they're questioning it, you know, would you advise them administering epi? So, the answer is it never hurts to give it. So if you okay. have, if you, th you if you think you need, if you think you um want to give it, give it because there's no downsides. So if the answer is if you think yes. If you're worried about giving it, give it. Okay. So, yeah, that tends to be my advice. If you if you think about it, it's like we often in medicine, if you think about doing a lab test because you're worried about something, you better do the lab test unless you can rule it out. And if you think it's anaphylaxis and you think it might be, just give it because there's really no downside besides the, okay. the medical course. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, that will clear things up for a, a lot of people, I'm sure. Um, another question, if we use one um, epinephrine auto-injector, how long should we wait for the symptoms to improve before giving a second one? You should see a difference within 5 to 10 minutes. Okay. Usually it's much faster, but sometimes it takes as long as 5 to 10 minutes. If you don't see improvement in 5 to 10 minutes, then I would repeat. Okay, great. Thank you. But, but um, my only comment is that if you get someone had hives and coughing and vomiting, you give epinephrine, the coughing and the vomiting has stopped. You, you'll, they may get flushed or they have an increased heart rate. They may get tremor just from the use of epinephrine. And the hives may be, the hives sometimes take longer to get better. And that stomach ache may take longer to get better. So as long as you're improving in the right direction, you probably don't need the second dose. But okay. you you have to really sort of say, hey, wait and see. Okay, great. Thank you. And and thanks again for answering all these questions. Um, you know, people are really engaged and they have some good ones. So um, a couple more, if I may. Um, is it normal to continue having breathing problems a day after a reaction? No. Okay. So if you're breathing problems a day later, you have a diff that's probably either you have a cold or a virus or asthma. Okay. Thank you. Reactions um, don't take that long. 
Okay. Do you know if going through an x-ray machine at the airport can um, uh, damage an epinephrine auto-injector? I've never heard, th heard that. No, it shouldn't. Okay. Thank you. I don't think we've heard of that here at FAIR as well. Um, another question came in. Is there any risk of overdosing on epinephrine? So, um, in the, all the studies that looking at epinephrine overdoses, it's really people. So, in some adults who've done two doses of epinephrine, which may have been an overdose, there have been a couple reports of elevated blood pressure, and a couple reports of angina or chest pain with two doses of epinephrine in the in adults. There's really been nothing seen in children. However, if you do IV epinephrine, the answer is yes, but no one's giving IV epinephrine, I hope, in this group. That, that means that's sort of, if you're doing IV epinephrine through an, into, into an infusion into your vein, it's a whole different story. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, is an EpiPen Junior safe to use even if the patient is under the weight that is advised? So, so this this really depends on your provider and your individual use of your child. Um, so we tend to say yes. There's a very few exceptions that we don't. I know in our neonatal the ne the NICU or neonatal intensive care unit, they don't use epinephrine ep EpiPen devices. They draw it up just due to the size of the child. But anything outside of that age group they tend to at our institution but I think that's really depends on the child and the how how little the the newborn is but for the, okay. for the vast majority no great thank you um, and I think we have time for maybe just a few more um, in your expertise do you know can antihistamines mask the symptoms and possibly prevent the recognition of anaphylaxis no. Okay. Okay, and I think we have one more. Um, do you know why does epinephrine sometimes not work if it is delayed? What we think why it doesn't work when it's delayed in the so cases of severe anaphylaxis is due to a couple things. The most likely scenario is that they've had so much release of all those medias, all those little chemicals that come out that you it doesn't it, there's too much for the epinephrine to counter interact. There's too much too many mediators out there. By doing it early it blocks the release and blocks the effects. By doing it late all the mediators are released already and it makes the effectiveness not as good. And sometimes the other reason is when you have so much late and there's, these are in like in, we're talking the severe episodes where they've had severe episodes of anaphylaxis. They get lower blood pressure, and then at that point you need not only epinephrine, you need IV fluids as well. So it's, you, you've sort of gotten past the point when, where epinephrine by itself is just going to do the trick. You need to get IV fluids in as well. Great. Thank you. And if I may, I'm really sorry, just because... We've got you here. If I can ask just one more question. Um, it just came in, and we actually received it a lot. Um, do you have any idea how sports, how can sports impact a reaction? So what we think is doing sports, so if this is more from oral immunotherapy trials, so, and this is just looking at the reactions of oral immunotherapy trials, looking at along those lines, because they're probably our best controlled things. So when we do oral immunotherapy trials, as everyone knows, you try to desensitize someone, making, giving them something they're allergic to, and you see allergic reactions all the time. And this is obviously done on, on, on research studies. And when we see our reactions, people sort of out of blue to get reactions, they typically occur when things that increase body temperature, such as exercise. Whether it increases absorption, it, it increases thing. Your heart rate, so everything is going around much more. All those are potential things that can cause things, make things worse. Okay, great. Thank you. We think Thank sports you so make much. things worse.
Perfect. Thank you. Um, you know, thanks to everybody listening in. Those were some amazing questions, and we definitely did our best to answer them in the order that they came in. And, you know, for additional information on epinephrine and anaphylaxis, you can head to our website. Um, I'd like to once again give a huge thank you to Dr. Spurgle for joining us today and providing some really great insights about epinephrine and anaphylaxis you know, particularly why we may be afraid of epinephrine and how to overcome that um, through a better understanding. Um, there was a lot of great, great answers to a lot of really important questions from our community, and I really think, you know, you'll help people today run their own lives, like you said, and not let food allergy run their lives. So, again, thank you, Dr. Spurgle. That concludes our webinar for today, um, and thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Until next time, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.